Today, Queen Elizabeth II is the head of state of the great nation of the Hebrew Covenant called Great Britain. Her genealogy chart, according to the College of Heralds in London, traces her blue bloodline back to Abraham, who many modern scholars believe to be the Egyptian pharaoh, Amenemhat I. By connecting 22 dots, the true Hebrew and royal Egyptian identity of Queen Elizabeth II comes into focus. Number one, what is the stone of Jacob, a Hebrew patriarch, doing beneath the queen's throne chair? Number two, why was the queen crowned at her coronation ceremony on top of a symbolic Egyptian step pyramid? Number three, the monarch's crown has 12 stones at the base, each representing the 12 Hebrew tribes. The 12 stones of the 12 tribes were also worn on the breastplate of Hebrew high priests in Canaan. Number four, the Union Jack represents the reunion of the United Kingdom of the 12 tribes of Jacob, or Jack-ub. The Union Jack is red, white, and blue, the same colors as the three crowns of Egypt. Number five, the royal scepter originates in ancient Egypt and was carried by the Egyptian god Amun and by Egyptian pharaohs who called themselves the Son of God. The royal scepter is now carried by pharaonic descendant Queen Elizabeth II. Her scepter contains the world's largest cut diamond called the Star of Africa. Number six, the queen's punishing flail or whip is partially hidden under her arm. The flail or whip also originates with the pharaohs of ancient Egypt. Number seven, the symbol of the bee can be found within the queen's royal wardrobe. In ancient Egypt, bees were the symbol of Egyptian royalty as well as the symbol of Egypt. Number eight, the symbols on the British coat of arms reveal Britain's Hebrew origin. According to the Bible, the harp symbolizes the Hebrew King David. The biblical lion and unicorn holding up the shield symbolize the nation of Israel. The motto, Dieu et mon droit, means God and my right, indicating the divine right of the British monarch to an eternal throne. Number nine, the headdress worn by judges and the queen's high-ranking officials originate in ancient Egypt. Number 10, kilts like the one worn by Prince Charles originate with the Egyptian pharaohs who wore white kilts. Number 11, the hymn Zadok the Priest written by Handel was performed at the Queen's coronation in 1952. Zadok the Priest was the biblical priest who anointed the Hebrew King Solomon while the people cried, God save King Solomon, long live King Solomon, may the king live forever. God save Queen Elizabeth. Long live Queen Elizabeth. May the Queen live forever. Number 12. During the coronation ceremony, the Queen turns to face the four corners of the globe. The orb carried by the Queen represents the globe over which the monarch rules. Number 13, the monarch's coronation gifts of a rod, bracelets, and a ring are a reenactment of the Bible story of the Hebrews, Judah, and Tamar. Number 14, royal jubilees originate in ancient Egypt. Egyptian pharaohs celebrated their jubilees after 30 years of rule. In pharaonic tradition, the queen has celebrated both silver and golden jubilees. Number 15. Incest was practiced by ancient Egyptian royalty. Mothers married sons and brothers married sisters to keep the power and the money all in the family. Like their pharaonic ancestors, the British monarchy have a long history of incestuous inbreeding. Number 16. The corpses of deceased pharaohs were preserved and entombed beneath their pyramid temples. 
the corpses of 19 deceased British monarchs are also preserved in marble tomb slabs beneath the modern day temple called Westminster Abbey. Number 17. The ancient pharaohs advertised their power with their image on coins and stone monuments. The power of the queen worldwide is advertised with her image printed on more coins and stamps than any other head of state in history. Number 18. The structure of government in ancient Egypt was a step pyramid model with the Grand Vizier and Priesthood one step below the Pharaoh. Today's monarchy reigns using a much more sophisticated pyramid model of authority. Number 19. The Pope's headdress is strikingly similar to the headdress of the Egyptian god Amun. His bent cross resembles the scepter of Amun. Number 20. Like the Egyptian pharaohs, British monarchs wear signet rings, which over the millennia have been passed down from their Hebrew ancestors. Number 21. The British Mint recently printed legal tender coins called the One True Ring and the Ring of Power. On one side of the coin is Queen Elizabeth II. On the flip side is the ring from Lord of the Rings. These legal tender coins printed by the British Mint raise the disturbing question, who is the real Lord of the Rings? One ring to rule them all. The inscription on the ring reads, one ring to rule them all, one ring to find them, one ring to bring them all, and in the darkness of their ignorance, find them. Number 22. The covenant that the biblical God gave to Abraham was a promise to make his name great and to make for him a great nation. Today, Great Britain is the only nation called great. In Hebrew, the word Britain literally means land of the covenant and British means man of the covenant. How on earth did the Hebrew throne of ancient Egypt and Canaan end up in Great Britain under Queen Elizabeth II? Historically, a series of powerful invaders, the Philistines, Assyrians, Babylonians, and Persians, conquered the land of Canaan, which the Hebrews called Israel. The Hebrew tribes of Manasseh and Dan joined forces and became the Macedonians, or Macedonians. They fled to Greece with their gold and their riches. They wore white kilts like the Egyptian pharaohs, played goatskin bagpipes, adopted the Greek culture, and settled along the river Danube, which they named after the tribe of Dan. By 322 BC, their leader, Alexander the Great, reconquered Egypt and appointed his general, Ptolemy I, as the new Hebrew pharaoh of Egypt. Cleopatra was the last in a succession of Hebrew Ptolemy kings. Although Cleopatra is considered to be the last of the Egyptian pharaohs, author Ralph Ellis claims that Jesus was the last of the Hebrew pharaohs of Egypt. Jesus, a pharaoh? How is that possible? The historical facts show that the last pharaoh of Egypt was Ptolemy XV, who was nicknamed Caesarian or Little Caesar. Born in 47 BC, Caesarian was the son of two of the most famous parents in world history, Roman ruler Julius Caesar and Egyptian pharaoh Cleopatra. When Caesarian's mother Cleopatra proclaimed herself to be the reincarnation of the virgin goddess Isis, Caesarian became the son of a virgin mother goddess. When Caesarian's father, Julius Caesar, was elevated to the status of God by the Roman Senate, Caesarian was recognized as the son of God and heir to God's kingdom, the Roman Empire. 
Caesarion was also recognized as the son of God in Egypt after his mother named him co-ruling Pharaoh of Egypt. Cleopatra declared Caesarion to be the king of kings at the age of 13 during the donations of Alexandria ceremony in 34 BC. history suddenly changed when Caesarion's father, Julius Caesar, was stabbed to death by his most trusted men. Octavian, the adopted son of Julius Caesar, swiftly seized power as the new Roman emperor. After Caesar's death, Cleopatra became romantically involved with a married commander from Caesar's army named Mark Antony. Mark Antony and Cleopatra parented three children, a twin boy and girl, followed by a second boy. Since Caesarion was Julius Caesar's son and the rightful heir to the Roman Empire, Cleopatra feared for his safety. When Octavian's mighty Roman army invaded Egypt, Cleopatra arranged for Caesarion's safe passage out of Egypt with her most trusted servants. Historians confirm that Cleopatra sent Caesarion to India. There are no historical records of Caesarion's fate, despite false rumors of his capture. Cleopatra's trusted servants who traveled with Caesarion became the boy's parent guardians. But who exactly were these parent guardians who Cleopatra entrusted her son to? Were their names Mary and Joseph by any chance? While Caesarion fled from Egypt with his parent guardians, Cleopatra and Mark Antony's three children were placed in the care of Mark Antony's wife. After suffering a crushing defeat against Octavian's invading Roman army, Mark Antony committed suicide by falling on his own sword. The devastated Cleopatra also committed suicide by a self-inflicted poisonous snake bite. While traveling undercover through Egypt with his parent guardians, Caesarion was forced to hide his identity and change his name. The Egyptian name for Jesus is Isu, which means the son of Isis. It can be found in Egyptian hieroglyphics. Matthew 2 verses 13 and 14 of the Bible tell a parallel story of the young child Jesus and his mother fleeing into Egypt with Joseph under the cover of night. In the year 1887, a book was published in Russia which rocked the Christian world. It was vilified and condemned. It was called The Unknown Life of Jesus Christ. The writer, Nicholas Notovich, was a respected journalist. Notovich claimed his book was a factual report of a trip he made to the Himalayan mountains in remote northern India. Notovich may well have been the first outsider to make his way to Hemis, an isolated Buddhist monastery hidden high in the Asian mountaintops. Gaining the confidence of an elderly monk, he was shown ancient scrolls which tell the story of a scholar and prophet named Issa. In these secret records, Issa is described as a foreigner from a small Mediterranean country. The stranger arrived in India as a teenaged boy to study the teachings of the Buddha. And according to the scrolls, he lived here 500 years after the prophet Buddha died, a time that coincides exactly with the lost years of Jesus. Nicholas Notovich was convinced that Issa was Jesus of Nazareth. 
and that he carried back to his homeland the principles of Buddhism. Half a century after Notovich was in Hemis in 1902, a Hindu priest sought refuge in the same remote Indian monastery. He too translated the scrolls and published a work. His translation verifies the work of Notovich. Ancient writings do exist from both Persia as well as India that Jesus did indeed travel to India, but we do not have 100% proof that he was there. The proof, however, does lie in his teachings when compared to sacred Buddhist writings. The authenticated ancient scrolls found at the Hemis Monastery near Leh in Kashmir document the life of Saint Isa, leaving home at the age of 13, joining a merchant caravan, traveling the Silk Route, and arriving in India at the age of 14. The Egyptian word for Jesus is Isu, the Greek word is Iesus, and the Arabic word for Jesus is Isa. Isa continued his travels through India and Tibet and the holy cities where Brahmin priests taught him to read and understand the Vedas. He learned Pali and studied the sacred sutras and how to cure by aid of prayer. He began teaching, performing miracles and explaining the holy scriptures in monasteries and market bazaars. As an adult, Isa finally left India and Tibet and traveled to Alexandria, Egypt. Why Alexandria? Because that's where Isa, whose previous name was Caesarian, grew up. That's where he last saw his mother, Cleopatra, alive. Isa spent three years in Egypt before searching for his younger half-sister and two younger half-brothers fathered by Mark Antony. They had inherited land in Syria. Despite false rumors of their early deaths, historians confirm that Caesarion and his two half-brothers mysteriously vanished from the historical record. Did they really vanish, or did they just reappear in the biblical record? According to the Bible, two of Jesus' twelve disciples were named James and Thomas. The Bible identifies James and Thomas as full brothers. Jesus, on the other hand, is identified as their half-brother. Thomas is not only identified as Jesus' younger half-brother, he is also called Jesus' twin. But how could Thomas possibly be Jesus' younger half-brother and his twin at the same time? The historical records show that Cleopatra had three children fathered by Mark Antony. Two of them were a twin boy and girl. Issa Caesarian clearly had a younger half-brother who is also a twin. At the scene of the crucifixion, there were two Marys present. One was Mary of Bithynia. When Roman Emperor Octavian invaded Egypt, Cleopatra sent her 13-year-old son Caesarian to India with Mary of Bithynia and Mary's wealthy uncle-husband named Joseph of Arimathea. Since Caesarion was the true heir to the Roman Empire, Emperor Octavian wanted him killed. Mary and Joseph became Caesarion's adoptive parents and later his loyal disciples. The second Mary present at the crucifixion was Jesus' younger half-sister, Mary Magdalene, whose birth name was Selene. She is also identified in the Bible as Mary of Cleopas, meaning Mary of Cleopatra. Selene was the orphan daughter of Cleopatra and Mark Antony, who both committed suicide. After being captured by Emperor Octavian, Selene was raised in Octavian's royal household with her two brothers, and with Octavian's son, Tiberius, who became the next Roman Emperor. They were raised together by the Emperor's sister, Octavia. Selene eventually married and became the Queen of Mauritania. Like her mother, Cleopatra, 
Selene wore the headdress of the goddess Isis. Selene's half-brother Caesarion finally returned to Egypt after 17 years in hiding. He searched for Selene and found her. He was now called Jesus Christ, a name with the same initials as his father, J.C., for Julius Caesar. He told Selene about his plan to capture his father's kingdom, the Roman Empire, which Emperor Octavian had stolen from him. He told her he would capture it not with weapons and armies, but by creating a new religion and transforming the Roman Empire into the Holy Roman Empire. Selene agreed to join her brother's spiritual revolution. She changed her name from Selene to Magdalene by adding the word Magda to her name, which means high place in Hebrew. Jesus Caesarian also searched for and found his two half-brothers, one of whom was Selene's twin. His nickname was Thomas Didymus, which means twin in Greek and Hebrew. Seventeen years after her suicide, Cleopatra's four children were all reunited again. Why are the pages of the Bible silent about where Jesus was and what he did for 17 years from the age of 13 to 30? Perhaps the most unusual legend of the missing years recounts a journey that would have taken Jesus thousands of miles from Nazareth. He would have traveled across two seas to England, a land whose history would become intertwined with Christian mythology. To this day in southern England, in Cornwall, villagers speak of Jesus having once walked here. Beneath these rolling meadows, the earth is laced with tin. 2,000 years ago, the story goes, the gospel character Joseph of Arimathea came to England to trade for the precious metal. And according to the legend, he brought with him his nephew, Jesus of Nazareth. At that time, ancient England was inhabited by the pagan Celts. Their religious leaders, the Druids, believed they were descended from a divine being. They also believed in an immortal soul. Some people in these valleys speculate that the Druids adapted their pagan religion to Christianity, not because they had heard stories of the Messiah, but because they had seen him. However, most scholars believe that it was the conquering Romans who arrived two centuries later who would convert the Druids to Christianity by persuasion and genocide. Since they were first found in a desert cave in 1947, the Dead Sea Scrolls have fueled speculation about the life of Jesus. Was he a member of the religious community which wrote the scrolls? They were found at Qumran, an easy walk from the very spot where it is said Jesus was baptized by John. The scrolls detail the beliefs of a Jewish sect called the Essenes, a group that flourished during the lifetime of Jesus. The beliefs of the Essenes often seem to mirror the teachings of Jesus. Zealots. band of revolutionaries included not only the Essenes but a violent Hebrew terrorist group called the Zealots who evolved into today's Zionists. We're going to a wedding. <laughs> speculation that Jesus married his half-sister Mary Magdalene. 
The Bible describes a wedding party in which Jesus uses his godly powers to magically turn water into wine for the party guests. Why did the Bible fail to name the names of the bride and groom at the wedding party? Is it because the names of the bride and groom were Jesus and Mary Magdalene? Since Jesus' cesarean learned the art of healing and meditation in India, and since he was provided with a foot support to stand on on the cross, and since he was taken down from the cross after only six hours, and since he was treated with expensive royal healing oils, did he survive the wounds of his crucifixion? Since Jesus and his wealthy Hebrew relatives all knew about Jesus' arrest and crucifixion in advance, was it planned, along with stories of his resurrection, to convert the Roman Empire into the Holy Roman Empire? My Lord and my God! Like his father Julius Caesar, who was officially elevated to the status of God, Jesus' Caesarean was not only elevated to the status of God, he recaptured his father's kingdom and expanded the Holy Hebrew Empire all the way to Great Britain and the United States of America. What then, little king? <laughs> A review of royal genealogy charts confirms that today, Israel, Great Britain, and the United States are all ruled by descendants of the Hebrew tribes of Israel. The big question is, if Caesarian was born in 47 BC, how could Caesarian possibly be Jesus? Jesus was born in the year zero, wasn't he? To begin with, the year zero does not exist on today's Gregorian Christian calendar, which jumps from 1 BC to 1 AD. Experts confirm a seven-year error was made in converting from the Egyptian to the Roman to the Christian calendar. The only way to calculate Jesus' real age is from a Bible quote which states that Jesus was baptized in the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius. Since Tiberius grew up in Octavia's royal household with Caesarian's half-sister and brothers, that means Caesarian was very close in age to Tiberius, who was born in 3 BC. By comparing important dates in the Jewish, Muslim, and Christian holy books, there is a margin of error of at least 30 years. So what proof is there that Caesarian's half-sister, Selene, is in fact Mary Magdalene? They were both wealthy, they both shared the same names, they were both Hebrew, and they both lived in the same place at the same time under the same Roman rulers. The most convincing proof lies in a famous New York statue. The Statue of Liberty was financed, built, and delivered to New York Harbor as a gift from the French Grand Orient Temple Masons in 1886 with a commemorative plaque for all to see. The statue has nothing whatsoever to do with liberty. Its designer was French Freemason Frederick Auguste Bartholdi, who traveled extensively throughout Egypt. Bartholdi was silent about who the woman was that served as his inspiration for the statue. But there is only one woman whose face closely matches the uniquely masculine features of the Statue of Liberty, Caesarian's half-sister, Selene. Bartholdi used the ancient busts and minted coins of Cleopatra Selene as his models in designing the Statue of Liberty. By comparing a digitized photograph of the Statue of Liberty with a bust of Cleopatra Selene, the matching identity of Mary Magdalene and Selene becomes clear. The lips, the mouth, the sharp jaw, the thick neck, the protruding ears, the prominent nose, and the masculine features are a close match.
An ancient minted coin of Cleopatra Selene reveals that even her hairstyle and hair tie ribbons are an identical match with the Statue of Liberty's hairstyle and ribbons. The Statue of Liberty was intentionally designed to appear pregnant beneath the folds of her robe. The implication is that Mary Magdalene had children. Their names were Tamar and Jesus the Justice, whom the Merovingians, British royalty, and elite Brotherhood of Freemasons claimed to be descendants of. With the blur of confusing Judases, Thomases, Jameses, Marys, and Josephs found in the Bible, many researchers have been challenged by the Bible's name game and its who's who mysteries. One way of decoding the Bible is to profile the main cast of characters and create a royal genealogy chart. The connection between the lives of the main Bible characters and the lives of real, historical figures line up like answers in a crossword puzzle. Far from being poor and uneducated, Jesus' inner circle of family and disciples were well-educated and well-off descendants of royalty. The disciple called Nicodemus of Bethany was in reality the son of Nicomedes IV of Bithynia. Joseph of Arimathea was in reality Joseph of Judea, an extremely wealthy tin merchant and descendant of King Zedekiah and Mattathias. The Virgin Mary of Bethany was, in reality, Mary of Bithynia and wife of her rich uncle, Joseph of Judea. Mary Magdalene, Jesus of Nazareth, Thomas, and James were the wealthy royal offspring of Hebrew-Egyptian Ptolemy queen Cleopatra VII. Why did the Bible alter and even omit key historical names and dates? To cover up the real Hebrew identities of the royal ruling families of Egypt and the Holy Roman Empire whose secret religion was and still is the cult of Amun. Why in the world did first century Jews living at the time of Jesus threaten to punish by death anyone who dared to copy, sculpt, or draw the face of Jesus and his graven image? What were they afraid of? Were they afraid perhaps he might be recognized for who he really was? <laughs> After the crucifixion, a Jewish rebellion against Roman rule broke out in Jerusalem. The Roman soldiers destroyed Solomon's temple, burned Jerusalem, and eventually renamed the land of Israel Palestine. The Hebrew tribes dispersed from the land of Israel and joined together into a ferocious force of brutal seafaring warriors. They named themselves after their six great ancestors, the six Hebrew Hyksos kings who once ruled Egypt. The VI in their name, Vikings, is the Roman numeral for six, six kings. Dan was the largest tribe of Israel and the first to replace the god of Judaism with pagan fertility gods. The tribe of Dan became seafaring pirates, looting their way from Greece along the Mediterranean leaving evidence of their migration route. 
Like signposts, they incorporated the name of Dan into the names of mountains, towns, and rivers, like the mighty River Danube. They raided their way up the coast of Europe and built settlements in the British Isles and in Scandinavia. The country of Denmark literally means the mark of Dan. Carvings of snakes and dragons on their ships, the red and white stripes on their sails, and archaeological relics reveal that the tribe of Dan became none other than the dreaded Vikings. The pagans arrived like stinging hornets and spreading on all sides like fearful wolves, robbed, tore, and slaughtered not only beasts of burden, but even priests and monks and nuns. They came to the church of Lindisfarne and destroyed everything, trampled and polluted the holy places, their mouths froth, their eyes stare, they howl like wild beasts. Joined by the Israeli tribe of Naphtali, they continued their reign of terror through the British Isles, accumulating massive amounts of wealth. Then the unthinkable happened. Their king, King Canute, was crowned King of England, Denmark, Norway, and Sweden in 1016 AD. And so the tribes of Israel had found a new homeland, and the throne of Israel had found a new throne, the throne of England. Danish royalty from the tribe of Dan intermarried and became related to almost all of the monarchies of Europe, including Queen Elizabeth of England. The bloodline of the tribe of Dan was firmly established in royal power circles. A unique Viking genetic disease called Dubitra's contracture, causing tightening of the tendons in the hand, give it a claw-like appearance. U.S. President Ronald Reagan and British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher contracted the Viking genetic disease and are believed to be descendants of the Vikings and thus descendants of the tribe of Dan. has misled the public into believing that Queen Elizabeth II is a symbolic ceremonial figurehead with little or no real power, that she is a cold but harmless old relic who passes her time sipping tea at the palace. Nothing could be further from the truth. As British monarch, Queen Elizabeth II is the wealthiest, most powerful person on earth. She embodies the crown and supreme world power. Presidents of the United States are forbidden any title of nobility and are subservient to the monarch. The U.S. President is Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces based at Camp David, which is known to insiders as Camp King David. Prime Ministers in Commonwealth nations like Canada and Australia are also subservient representatives of the British King or Queen. They are her spokesmen. The Governor Generals of the Queen's Commonwealth nations represent and exercise the Queen's power on her behalf. What the general public doesn't realize is that their leaders are only representatives of the monarch and do not possess the power. They exercise the power. They do not reign, they rule. The monarch, on the other hand, reigns but does not rule, possesses the power but does not exercise it. By delegating her powers instead of exercising her powers, the Queen is left safely outside and above the conflicts and divisions of the political process. She is protected from becoming a target of political hostilities. Meanwhile, the general public is kept in the dark about the true powers that the Queen actually possesses, powers that she delegates but has not yet chosen to exercise. So what exactly are these powers that the Queen possesses but has not chosen to exercise? Her powers include the power to choose the Prime Minister and to dismiss the Prime Minister through her Governor General, the power to dismiss ministers and the government, the power to dissolve Parliament and call new elections, 
the power to refuse legislation passed by Parliament, the power to command the armed forces and raise a personal militia. She has the power to read confidential government documents and intelligence reports, the power to declare a state of emergency and issue proclamations. She has the power to call elections and enact laws in Her Majesty's name. Few people realize that not a single law is passed without the Queen's consent. She has the power to exercise Crown prerogatives, which means the Queen can declare war through her Prime Minister without even the agreement of Parliament. She has the power to grant and bestow titles and honors like Sir, the power to pardon convicted criminals. So why has the Queen been allowed to legally possess all of these supreme powers? For the sake of tradition? What exactly is the meaning of the term the Crown? The Crown is defined as executive powers exercised in the name of the monarch. The actual crown itself worn by the monarch is a symbol of the Queen's executive powers. The Parliamentary Oaths Act of 1866 requires all leaders of 54 Commonwealth nations to swear an oath of loyalty to the Queen, not to the people who elected them. I swear by Almighty God that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, her heirs and successors according to law, so help me God. Those who do not swear allegiance to the Queen are deemed unfit for office, including the Prime Minister, police, military, judges, legislators, lawyers, and public servants. New citizens to the Queen's Commonwealth nations must swear allegiance to Her Majesty the Queen. Public land in the Queen's colonies like Canada is called Crown land and includes Aboriginal land. Government corporations are called Crown corporations. The Central Bank of Canada and the Canadian Mint are Crown corporations independent of most government controls. Neither Canada nor Australia, two huge and independent countries in their own right, has dispensed with her services as their head of state. Forms, stationery and printing are printed by the Queen's printer. Canadian warships are called HMCS, Her Majesty's Canadian Ship, and in Australia they're called HMAS, Her Majesty's Australian Ship. Canada's National Police Force is called the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. All government contracts are between a company or individual and Her Majesty. Court summons are issued in the name of the Queen, and all public inquiries are called royal commissions. Commonwealth money carries the Queen's image worldwide as a reminder of her authority. The Queen is the lifetime hereditary head of state of Great Britain and her colonies and is unelected and unaccountable. It is against the law to advocate the abolition of the monarchy. After the revolution, the French started calling her the Lady, but in English, the Queen is still the Queen. Move, I tell you. Originally in India, Persia, and Arabia, she was male and weak. Check to your grace. But she changed sex in Europe in the Middle Ages and became the strongest of all chess pieces. I fear the Queen is powerless now. The Queen is never powerless. For example. What is the cost to British taxpayers to support the Queen and her Blue Blood entourage? The Public Accounts Committee and National Audit Office are forbidden to examine Queen Elizabeth Windsor's family finances, but the civil list payments are reviewed every 10 years. So for the year ended March 2002, the running expenses of the Windsor household were 7.9 million pounds, family spending 35.3 million, security 30 million, and the list goes on. How much is the Queen actually worth? The Queen's wealth is divided into three categories. Her wealth is the monarch, her visible personal wealth, and her invisible personal wealth. The Queen's wealth as the monarch includes 54 Commonwealth nations worldwide, millions of acres of crown land and resources, thousands of crown corporations, and the corporate city-state of London, which is the capital of world finance. The Queen's visible personal wealth, which was accumulated tax-free until 1992, includes royal yachts, Rolls-Royces, racehorses, five castles, 
the world's largest collection of jewels, 20,000 old masterpieces, and billions of Class A shares in blue chip stocks and bonds which have been invested and reinvested over and over again tax-free. Most of the Queen's family fortune was inherited from her ancestors' illegal opium trade with China and the black slave trade. In 1977, the Bank of England nominees was established to hide the Queen's personal portfolio of wealth. As the British monarch, the Queen has access to privileged information, state secrets, and the world's top financiers. She is immune to accusations of insider trading or conflicts of interest. Her financial portfolio includes Rio Tinto, General Electric, Royal Dutch Shell, British Petroleum, Archer Daniels Midland, and the list goes on. The Queen's visible billions are but a tiny fraction of her invisible wealth accumulated through the black nobility. What is the black nobility? The black nobility is a wealthy aristocracy of elite ruling families who solidified their power in the 12th century by intermarrying with the wealthy godfather families of Venice, Italy. During the bloodbaths of the Christian Crusades, this brutal Italian oligarchy captured the trading monopolies. Over the centuries, the black nobility have used their power and wealth to rape, plunder and exploit every corner of the globe. Dr. John Coleman's book, The Committee of 300, describes the history of assassinations, kidnappings, robbery, rape, blackmail, coercion, and terror committed by these inbred families on a grand scale. Today, they enrich themselves from the illegal drug and arms trade using well-distance intermediaries. An estimated $280 billion in flight capital and drug money flows into their secret Swiss accounts. Who are these ruling black nobility families? They include the House of Hanover, Germany, the House of Habsburg, Austria, the House of Orange, Netherlands, the House of Liechtenstein in Liechtenstein, and most importantly, the House of Guelph in Britain. All of these family houses can be found on Queen Elizabeth II's family tree. The black nobility are the founders of the Committee of 300, which is also known as the Illuminati, or Illuminated Ones. Queen Elizabeth II is head of the committee of these 300 ruling families. The Illuminati was formed to achieve one main objective, one world government, called the New World Order. NWO spells own, backwards. All of today's think tanks originate from the Committee of 300 and include the Round Table, the CFR Council on Foreign Relations, the United Nations, the Bilderbergs, the Club of Rome, the RIIA, and the Trilateral Commission founded by David Rockefeller. Since the British colonization of America, many powerful American families have formed secret societies that cooperate with the black nobility like the Skull and Bones Fraternity at Yale University, which is rooted in German Freemasonry. Its exclusive members are some of America's most powerful and wealthy men, including two United States presidents, President George W. Bush and his father, President George Herbert Walker Bush. The Order of the Skull and Bones is located on the campus of Yale University. John Pogue is a Yale graduate and the producer of a Hollywood movie called Skulls, based on the chilling radiation night. Chosen members enter a windowless hall on campus where they strip naked and lay inside a coffin. During the rituals, they reveal their innermost secrets, including the intimate details of their sexual history. Senior bonesmen dressed in robes chant over the new member in a symbolic death and rebirth ceremony. Each new member takes a vow, swearing a lifetime commitment to the Brotherhood, secretly known as the Brotherhood of Death. The cross bones symbolize the right of new members to double cross and use any means possible on their rise to power. They're supposed to recount their entire sexual histories in sort of a dim, 
uh, a dimly lit, cozy room. The other 14 members are sitting on uh, plush couches, and the lights are dimmed, and there's a fire roaring. And uh, the, this activity is supposed to last anywhere from between one to three hours. So George Bush, George W. Bush, recounted his sexual history? That would have been something they would have done, yes. What is the point of this? I believe the point of the year in the tomb is to forge such a strong bond between these 15 new members that after they graduate, for them to betray Skull and Bones would mean they'd have to betray their 14 closest friends. One can't help but make certain comparisons with, uh, with the Mafia, for example. Secret society, <coughs> bonding, stakes may be a little higher in one than the other, <laughs> but everybody knows everything about everybody which is a form of protection. I think Skull and Bones has had slightly more success than the Mafia um, in the sense that, you know, the leaders of the five families are all doing a hundred years in jail, and the leaders of the Skull and Bone families are doing four and eight years in the White House. Bones is not restricted to Republicans. Yet another Bonesman has his eye on the Oval Office. Senator John Kerry. Skull and Bones is so tiny, that's what makes this staggering. There are, there are only 15 people a year, which means there are about 800 living members at any one time. We know that a lot of Bonesmen have gone to positions of great power. That's what Skull and Bones' purpose is, to get as many members as possible into positions of power. Though there is this mythology about Skull and Bones running, pulling the strings of government. You're saying the fact is Skull and Bones are pulling the strings of government. They do have many individuals in influential positions, and that's why this is something that we need to know about. The New England Genealogy Society confirms that 19 U.S. presidents are descendants of King Edward III of England. Like European royalty, America's blue bloodlines are maintained through intermarriage. George W. Bush is descended from several kings of England and Scotland. He is also a distant cousin of Queen Elizabeth II of England. of the Committee of 300 have given birth to the Tavistock Institute, HARP, the Rand Corporation, Stanford Research Institute, and the Institute for Policy Studies, among others. One study group at the Rand Corporation specializes in predicting the timing and direction of thermonuclear war. These institutes and corporations are engaged in the secretive development of brainwashing and population control techniques, the mapping and patenting of human and animal DNA, and the genetic engineering of human, animal, and plant life. They are also developing chemical, bacteriological, and psychological weaponry, as well as tectonic and climate weaponry. How does the Committee of 300 justify their monstrous acts of evil? Their common philosophy is that the end justifies the means, no matter how diabolical. That end is to fulfill their biblical covenant using apocalyptic weaponry for an eternal throne and one world empire. Was the timely earthquake in Iran triggered by natural causes or by man-made causes? In the late 1800s, Serbian-American inventor Nikola Tesla developed tectonic weaponry capable of triggering earthquakes. He claimed the technology could split the earth in half with the press of a button. Tesla sold the patents for his earthquake technology to U.S. weapons manufacturer Westinghouse in 1885. Today, the U.S. military controls and uses the technology at their high-frequency active auroral research project called HARP, located at Gakona, Alaska. In his book, Angels Don't Play This HARP, Dr. Nick Begich claims the U.S. military has developed tectonic and climate weaponry that can trigger earthquakes, manipulate weather systems, and cause floods, droughts, and hurricanes that threaten the economies of other nations. HARP's vast installations of antenna towers zap the sky's protective ionosphere with an electromagnetic beam 
creating extremely low frequency radio waves called ELF waves. These ELF waves bounce back to Earth as plasma balls. This tectonic weaponry can be more lethal than any of America's most powerful nuclear weapons. Only one nation in the world has been insane enough to drop atomic weapons of mass destruction on the innocent populations of two large Japanese cities, chemical weapons of mass destruction on innocent civilians in Vietnam, and depleted radioactive uranium weapons of mass destruction on the people of Iraq. Straight. You go. 